Hello, Schmodown Rundown fans. This is your favorite Schmodown competitor, Miss Movies. Wanted to talk to you about me undies today. Now, Aaron has been doing these ads, and I said, Aaron, you need an actual subscriber to do this for you. And he said, Well, who would that be? And I said, That's me. I've been subscribed for over a year to me undies. It's like a perfect little present that comes in the mail every single month, and I absolutely love it. Here's a great stat that Frank is going to like 51% of my underwear is me undies. I have them more than any other brand, and it's because because they feel so good that even the most skeptical people like Brian, he's going to love them. We're all going to love them. You're going to love them because they're made from micromodal fabric that's three times softer than cotton. They also come in all types of colors, patterns, styles, and they release a new limited edition pattern each month that always sells out. This month is a rainbow confetti print called Celebrate, so go get it before they're all gone. Get 20% off of your first pair plus free shipping at MeUndies.com slash rundown right now. That's MeUndies.com slash rundown. One more time, MeUndies.com slash rundown. Tell them this movie sent you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the Schmodown Rundown. Introducing first, Frankie Stats Janish, and their co-host, the man of controversy, Mr. Brian the Duke David. And finally, your host, Aaron Turner. Let's get ready. Schmodown! It's episode number 39 of the Schmodown Rundown. My name is Aaron. I am your host, as always. Joining me today, Statman Carruthers himself, Mr. Frank Janish. What's going on, man? What's going on, Aaron Brian? I have so many names. I I can't keep track anymore. I'm doing my best to keep coming full force with these great names. I hope they're working out for you. If not, I apologize. <laughs> All right, well, guys, I mean, we did... Four shows in eight days. It takes a lot out of us. Brian, how you feeling, man? Aaron, Frank, I'm feeling pretty bad as I said something recently that caused a great deal of uproar and disappointment. But before I issue an apology, I think we should catch the audience up to speed and roll a clip of what I actually said. Have you played a match with even the smallest amount of alcohol in you? Do you think a little bit of alcohol would improve your skills to take the edge off a little bit? Or do you prefer to be sober going into a match? It's an experiment I have yet to try, but I have been considering it. Uh, I've had a a number of uh, beers on the sideline watching matches, but I have yet to try it for my own. I think now that I have debuted in each of the league's I might be more open to possibly giving that a shot. So to Rachel Cushing and Ken Knapsack of the Nerds Watch, I just want to apologize for incepting the idea into Rachel's head that she should experiment with alcohol before or during a Schmodown match. Rachel was quite open about her nerves and jitters, so the intent was to gain a clearer perception about the possibilities and the promise without realizing the pitfalls and the perils. So don't dwell on this nerd's watch because this loss is on me. Well, Brian, I think that's really big of you to make such an apology. I cannot speak for Rachel or Ken, but I can say as a fan of the nerd's watch, I sincerely appreciate that apology. Aaron, I'm just trying to be a better man. And Frank Janish, I understand that you also have an apology you would like to give. Feel free. Well, it's not so much an apology as a correction. Uh, I am sorry I did give out some false information. False news. Sure, you can hashtag that, I guess. Um, When we were talking to Christian and even during uh, when we were talking about the matches last week for Collision, I had said that Merle only missed two questions through two matches. That is incorrect. He missed three, so not that big of a deal. But nonetheless, uh, he was 37 of 40 in two matches. So I just wanted to clear that up. Well, Frank, have you ever heard of the internet? It doesn't matter if you're off by an inch or a mile. You're going to get torched. <laughs> that's going to happen. Okay, so. that's a bit of a different ending to that quote, but all right. 
Well, he also answered his five pointer. He missed his three pointer. That was something that we oh, messed, yes, that's messed right, up yeah. on as well. Yeah. So well, you know, I was like keeping score at like two o'clock in the morning, so I got my He already apologized once. I got my numbers just, mixed just, up there. So here's the thing. I blame Frank's presence at Collision for the mistakes. So people, if you go to these actual events, you're gonna make mistakes more than usual too. Wait a minute, I thought of something uh a few days ago that it kind of dawned on me and that I'm surprised no one brought this up either, whether you guys or in the comment section, everyone that I talked to at Col- for Collision lost. I talked to Jeremy Johns, he lost to Hector Navarro. I talked to Jeff Snyder, he lost to Christian Harloff. I talked to uh, John Roca and Mark Riley for the triple threat, they both lost. I didn't talk to Hector Navarro, I didn't talk to anyone from Rotten Tomatoes, I didn't talk to Dan Merle, they all won. So, um, and and that's, JTE that's a, walked off on you. That's right, JTE walked away from me. I don't know if I should have said this because now I don't think anyone's going to want to talk to me anymore. Yeah, but, Frank, Jan- uh, Frank Janish yeah. seems like you're harboring a lot of LB these days. A lot of loser behavior seems to be rubbing off on you there. I, I guess I don't. Does it work that way? I'm not familiar. I, I can, I, can I WebMD how that works? Frank, you're always welcome in the den. Trust me. <laughs> oh God, who isn't? Oh. Oh, boy. Yeah, we'll definitely get to that. Speaking of people being added to the den, let's talk about what happened this Tuesday where there was no match. Didn't happen. It was a state of the horsemen, state of the horse persons, if you will, where Roka came out, Matt Nose came out, I think. Bibiani was there. Robert Meyer Burnett was there. So they, they got to clear the air here because Bibiani left the horse persons to go do his own thing with Ricky for some reason. And we needed to clear it up. And Bibiani definitely cleared that up by not rejoining the horse person. As a matter of fact, he turned in his horse and his badge. <laughs> that was hilarious. <laughs> and not only that, they had badges. We got the debut of his partner, Mr. Whitney Seibold, the most well dressed person and well groomed person, I may say, in the Schmodown. First class all the way for Whitney. What did you think, Frank? Nos would probably disagree with the well dressed, uh, as he pointed out the, the button. That's that funny. Three p- three p suit. Yeah, that was pretty hilarious. Bibiani coming out, turning in his badge and horse, uh, had me dying. And then you got Ken saying they had badges. Uh, that killed me. That was hilarious. Uh, everything about this little exchange with Bibiani uh, was really funny. Uh, I found it very entertaining. A little ridiculous, but that's okay. That's kind of the point. And uh, and then Whitney coming out. The, the beauty to Bibiani's beast. So uh, that, that was pretty funny as well. Uh, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed this uh, little this little bit between them. It was really funny. What did you think, Brian? So I've been listening to the B-Movies podcast recently, much to uh, Bibiani's chagrin. And I thought I knew who Whitney was based on the crowd shots due to those behind-the-scenes videos and whatnot, as well as the pre-match stuff that Jen does. And I thought that Whitney was Lon Harris. I confused the two. (laughs) For some reason, I just thought Lon was Whitney because he was always kind of hanging around the beast. So once I saw Whitney appear, I'm like, oh, that's not the guy I thought it was. And instantly I made the the Harry Ellis comparison from Die Hard. And I thought I was being super original and innovative with that comparison. And as it turned out, he's been getting that for like 10 years apparently. So I wasn't the first one to, to compare him to Harry Ellis from Die Hard, but it's still a valid comparison, and I love what this guy brings already. I like the attitude. I like the arrogance. I like the uh, character that he's putting out there, and this team is going to be dangerous, guys. Yeah, Whitney's credentials speak for themselves. He's been a critic for a long time, a well-respected critic across the various platforms that he does. His boss, Quentin Tarantino. I mean, come on right now. But I like the dynamic. I like how Whitney came in. He's the kind of yuppie if that's the word i can use i don't know he's kind of like that kind of heel he has a little bit of an arrogance to him and i like that and and bibiani screaming we're people too i enjoyed that that was a lot of fun <laughs> but now we're left with three horse persons and robert meyer burnett uh may have had a stroke I'm not really sure but he decides that he's done with the horse persons as well and he joins the lion's den led by of course Tom Dagnino, Grace Hancock, a picture of JTE, Jeff Snyder, and Mark Andreco. Frank, what did you think of this turn? Well, I'm kind of surprised he went 
to the lion's den kind of surprised not really because i always kind of felt like his character was way over the top for the four horsemen i don't think the four horsemen were true heels through and through i did <laughs> think that robert meyer burnett his persona his character really did belong kind of in line with the lion's den very brash very loud a different kind of loud, I should say, because we, we know Roka, the, the outlaw, that past outlaw was very loud. So when he went over to the Lion's Den, kind of made sense because they do need an inner geekdom player, although I don't, I think the Lion's Den kind of settled for Robert Meyer Burnett as an inner geekdom player. I just don't think he's really that great, to tell you the truth. I know he's won a couple matches, or one match. It's fine. I, I don't care that he left. I don't even really care that Bibiani left. I think it was the best thing for that faction and for Bibiani, because when you look at it, Bibiani's agenda lines up very closely with Roka's. And when you have two people with the same agenda in the same stable, you're going to get what has happened over the past months between Bibiani and Roka. So um, I do like the split. It just seemed really crazy, but it was pretty funny. Now, Brian, I know you're a big fan of Team Top 10 and what they bring to the table. What did you think of Robert Meyer Burnett split in here? Tommy D, our good friend Tommy D, Tom Dagnino, this week belonged to him. He pulled off one of the coups of the century by stealing Robert Meyer Burnett to join the Lions Den, aka Top Den. They're that good now. And basically, they have gone out and they've grabbed all of the best heels in the game. Bibiani, I wouldn't classify him as a straight up heel. He's kind of more of a character. Uh, that's in between. He can be a heel one minute and, and kind of whatever he wants in others. So I like that he is now off on his own, doing his own thing with Ricky as well as Harry Ellis. But I like that the Den is now even stronger because you might as well put all of the best heels in the same group, especially when Robert fulfills the inner geekdom prowess that Top Den did not have previously. So Tommy D making moves. This is why he is the best manager in the game and uh bottom 10 whatever they're trying to do whatever they're trying to do as far as turning face it's not working for me i gotta shout out ken knapsack for having the best reaction to robert meyer burnett as he heard the lion's den music he just simply said ah shit <laughs> yeah <laughs> the great. best the best for perfectly placed by the way when tommy d compliments your jacket you know you're doing something right. So that jacket that Burnett wears, that is just too perfect to not be in top den. So Burnett is now where he belongs. Well, I mean, we would be remiss if we didn't add that now it's Roka and Nost again, flying solo for now, and their show, Top Ten, is actually a thing again. Do we think, Frank, I know you're a big fan of, of Roka and Nost. Do you think that the show coming back will help them? Absolutely. Uh, back when it was a regular thing, the top 10 show, I always kind of pointed towards the fact that with both of these guys running through 10, 20 movies a week, come up with their list for the show, you're going to remember a lot more stuff. Um, you're going to remember a lot more movies because you're going to be watching 10 to 20 films a week. So when you have a match, it's very beneficial. And I think the, and then when the show went away, you kind of saw at least uh, from at nose, his performance was very up and down, a little more down than up, but nonetheless up and down. So I think this is actually really much more beneficial for Nost than Roka, but it's going to work out very well for both in the end. And I think, you know, we'll see top 10 have that 2015 performance come back. Maybe not as great because the competition is, is better now and the questions are a little bit tougher, but I think you're going to see them get back to that kind of level because in 2015, they were doing a top 10 show all the time. They've been doing it for a while. You saw how they competed in that tournament and then, how they took Rotten Tomatoes to the end, had to play a great match, one of the classic matches in the Schmodown. Uh, you don't you don't play in great matches like that without knowing a lot of stuff, and Top 10 show, I think, really helped them in that regard. So I'm looking forward to seeing how the Top 10 show elevates uh, the team's play. I kind of worry about Roka and his schedule, because he's got the guy's got a full-time job. He's got Outlaw Nation, Cinephiles, and now add the Top 10 show back onto it. I'm not saying that it's going to hinder him in terms of performance but man that's a lot of that's very time consuming I, i'm sure he's more than willing to do all those things but that's got to take a toll on you brian what do you think the return of bottom 10 oh, does right. not does not change anything for me because one of the players in bottom 10 does not know who the director of whiplash or manchester by the sea is so 
making top 10 lists has nothing to do with recent information that someone playing in the Schmodown needs to know. Well, they'll just make a recent top 10 movies list and then go from there. Top 10 Damien Chazelle movies? I don't <laughs> think so. There, has there been 10? Exactly. Exactly. No, I, I my said point. top 10 recent movies. I didn't say recent Damien Chazelle movies. Even though some of his movies would fall in the recent category. If you don't know who Kenneth Lonergan is or Damien Chazelle, or there's plenty of other examples, Chadwick Boseman, you're not a uh, factor. Not, not a factor. You are not a factor if you don't know who those people are. But Robert Meyer Burnett, no longer a member of the horse persons. We're down to two. I guess they're horse people. I don't know what you call them. Now that Bibiani's not there, do we call them horsemen? I don't know. What do, what do you call them anymore, Frank? What do you call them? I think I think you can still call them the horsemen, just minus the four. <laughs> I think that's two, fine. The two horsemen. That sounds really intimidating. Oh, well, I didn't say call them two horsemen. I just said call them the horsemen, minus the four. So call them the horsemen. Maybe down the line, they could be the, the horseman's watch. I'm just throwing that out there. No, don't do that. Just saying. It's, don't do that. I'm just saying. Look at I'm not going to say it's happened right away, but if that were to ever happen, I think that's probably my top pick for a perfect pairing. It makes a lot of sense. Come out of fantasy land, Franklin. It's crazy. I don't. Have you seen Ken and Roka's uh, interactions lately? I mean, it's very, it's very friendly. All right, fine. But let's jump into that match. It was a singles match, the only one we had this week. Matt Most of aforementioned Horsemen and Team Top Ten versus the leader of the Lions Den, flying solo, Mr. Tom Dagnino. Let's talk about the pre-match interviews. Brian, what did you see? What did you like? Uh, more pizza guy banter from Tom. Tom's the best in the game when it comes to this, and it was uh, worth the price of admission for just that alone. Yeah, the match wasn't very good, but this stuff, the post and pre-match, vintage Tommy D. I'm going to actually give Matt Nose a little bit of credit here. He and and Tom, I swear, like wear the same kind of clothes. Like Dagnino's got the Bernie Kosar shirt from like 1989, and Matt Nose is usually rocking a Magic Johnson from 1992. <laughs> they have the same kind of style a little bit. There, I I uh, yeah, I would kind of disagree with that. I mean, in in terms of those particular shirts, shirt wise, maybe yeah. The banter from both of these players. Um, I think there's some of the best uh, that we have in the league. You know, Tom Dagnino is a little more, I guess you could say, more fantastical, a little more crazy and out there, and sometimes doesn't make any sense, but it works. It's funny. And then knows the, he's a little more, I think it's more wit, really off-the-cuff stuff pertaining to whatever situation he's in. So it's kind of, they're kind of the same, but also different at the same time. When Nose can go after Tom Dagnino, it's usually some pretty funny stuff. And uh, so I, I enjoyed these these pre match interviews a lot. I, I want to give credit to uh, I want to give credit to Matt Nose in one area: his intro music, perfect bomb track by Rage Against Ooh. the Machine. And most importantly, he came out on time. He, he came in. It. He came in when Zach does his little growl. So uh, that was uh, well done. But that's about it as far as uh, this match goes. That intro, that's probably the most on-point intro we've seen. I mean, he hit his cue right on time. It was it was pretty good. Yeah. He may not know who Damien Chazelle is, but at least he uh, knows when to come out on cue or on time. All right, let's jump into round one. It was Matt Nost getting five points. Tom Dagnito getting two. Bit slow going here, but we're A trucking bit? along. <laughs> What's that? A bit slow? Holy crap. A bit slow. I mean, Nose did get five. He did yeah. get five out of eight. Tom was very, you know, very slow there. Could have had two extra points if you ask him with the uh, Chadwick Boseman answer, which was not really even close to Chadwick Boseman, but... Can I can I comment on this? Oh, please. When it comes to Chadwick Boseman and Damien Chazelle, I would have given those points to Tom because he knew, oh boy. He knew generally who they were and he was close enough. And as this league has shown, they are willing to give leeway in plenty of situations. But because of Tom's uh, personality, because of his reputation, he does not get the benefit of these calls. He does not get uh, the Michael Jordan type whistle in these situations. Guys like Tom, guys like me will not get these calls in a game like this. But when you look at the JTE situation at, during his match on the 4th of July, Kenneth Logan, whatever it was, they are triggered by that. They had that in mind, and so they were trying to avoid another uh, Kenneth Logan again. So unfortunately, Tom was the victim of this, but 
I would have given him these points just because he was close enough and they've allowed leeway until recently. I feel like he just transformed into Mark Andreco there for a second, but the challenge, those go ahead and challenging, it was upheld. I feel like it should have been for Damien Chazelle. You obviously feel differently. Frank, what do you think? No, I thought not awarding Tom those points was correct. Yeah, you could tell that he had an idea of the names. He didn't actually know the names. Look, we've heard from Christian that it's it's kind of on a, or a, was it Riley? I think it said in the interview, it's kind of on a case-by-case basis, and I, this is just what that is. That was and, Riley's interpretation, though. Yeah, not right, it was, yeah, it was, yeah, it was Riley's right. So it's... <laughs> Chaz, I mean, that's, I don't even know what to say. I don't, even, I really don't know what to say to say that. I'm just, it shouldn't have been awarded. I'm glad it wasn't. Spelling has but it's not, not even, been. not even spelling. He couldn't even say it correctly. He wasn't even saying the name right. correctly. But they've given points to the Django in the past. So there has been plenty of leeway in these situations, but because of the player, he's not going to get those calls like a, a nicer player would. So I, again, I, it's, I, you I, never I know, know, you never know the way it's going to go. You don't, but I also don't agree that they would have. Would you? Would they have given that to Clark Wolf? No, they still wouldn't have given it to Clark Wolf. I don't think. Well, well Clark would have had to answer seven answers. But Clark would have known the actual names. Nine so. options. So. So what you're saying is, don't hate the player, hate the game. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying based on the leeway that has been established throughout the history of this league, I would have given those points to Tom because he had some idea, unlike. Matt knows to answer nothing. And in this case, I'd rather reward someone who has enough of the answer versus someone who has none of the answer. I believe you. I believe you when you say things like this. Thank you. (laughs) One more thing before we move on to round two. Campia tried to give away the answer again when he referenced J.K. Simmons during the question banter. So this could have given away the answer to one of the players just like that wag the dog moment at a collision. So uh, the the announcers have to be very careful because that can sway a player's answer quite easily. I'm actually going to jump on your bandwagon here with that. There was a question, I think Ellis and Christian were commentating and Ellis was taught one of the, the answer was sweet home Alabama or something like that. And Ellis was talking about the film, like describing what happened. Now, if you did really pick up the question of, what that movie was, but now you hear the describing things like, oh yeah, it kind of can jog your memory a little bit. So I see what you're saying there. I'm not going to go into detail, but if you go back and watch that wag the dog question, there's a lot more to that to where what Campia added changes the interpretation of how that would have played out had he not said anything. So it's a very tricky when there's too much color commentary. All right, well, let's go to round two where it was Matt Nose getting 90s, going two of four for three points. Tom Dagnino gets Spinner's Choice, the best thing he probably could ask for. He takes sports movies, gets a murderer's row of sports questions. Damn you, Skaliski. One of four for one point. Tom did get a steal, a one-point steal for Wolfgang Peterson. Matt Nose also got a one-point steal on the Invictus question. Round two did not go very well for either player. Frank, what'd you think? My word, I actually kind of felt bad for Tom. I was like, what kind of sports questions are these? I mean, surfing questions? Oh, jeez, I don't... Soccer, rugby, surfing. <laughs> That's some pretty difficult stuff. I mean, I don't know who who else would have gotten three out of the four, even using multiple choice. I, I really don't know. Um, so Matt, in that regard, got pretty lucky that, because, <laughs> you know, Tom spun Spinner's Choice. You would have think Tom would do really well, but when you get those kind of sports questions, um, it was bad. And then the 90s for Nost, uh, I thought it was a, a decent spin for him, a decent category for him, but even though he had to go multiple choice three times, only capitalize it on one time uh, using multiple choice. Not a great uh, second round, like you said, Aaron, for either of these people. Yeah, 90s quite broad, and I think we found out that sports movies are quite broad as well. So, Brian, what did you think here around two? The fact that Tom stole Wolfgang Peterson from Matt Nost and guest Russ Wheeler in the case of the Carrie Elwes Days of Thunder question I would have given him the win in this match right there. He really pulled off some great schmodown work right there alone. So I would have given him the win just for those two questions alone. I wish you could see my face right now when you said that. (laughs) Because, I mean, look, those were some of the highlights of the match, and yet I'm just still stuck on the round one treatment because this could have been a a closer match. I mean, it was close already, but it could have been a tie match 
that goes even longer than expected? Uh, huh. You know, I, I don't, I don't know, Brian. I, I, I think, I think we're good here. I, just, <laughs> just, just my opinion. Going into round three, Nost had the nine to four lead over Tom, which means that Tom had to go first. He missed the two pointer. Judd Apatow's directorial debut, The Forty Year Old Virgin. He did get the three, though. And this was an impressive answer. Leslie Nielsen in Spy Hard did not see that coming. That's but- my point. He's answered several questions that are awfully difficult. So he had the the greatest pulls of the match, and it's just disappointing that the uh, the first round did not set up a better outcome for him in the end. I feel like you're trying to make fetch happen, and it's just not it's just not going to happen. <laughs> So it came, it came down to Tom's five pointer, and wouldn't you know it? Unfortunately, point break rears its ugly head, and Tom misses the five and is TKO'd by Matt Nose. Nine to seven. Nine to seven is your final. Okay, Brian, nine to seven is your final. Matt Nose by TKO. What do we think here? Well, point break continues to be the bane of Tommy D's existence. I cannot believe that that's the question he lost on. Uh, people who follow the show closely will understand why it's the bane of his existence. But like I said, he had some impressive answers in this match. He did not win. If that first round went another way, it's very possible he would have come out on top because the pizza guy did not play well. The pizza guy missed some questions that a former team champion has to answer if he wants to have success in this league again, whether it's doubles, whether it's singles. And uh, I don't have a lot of confidence in uh, the pizza guy or any of his associations moving forward. But like I said, Tom Dagnino, regardless if he won this match, he won the week because he stole Robert Meyer Burnett. He's now a member of Top Den. and He's going to fill that inner geekdom void that they've been lacking this entire time. So, Tom is the star of the week, the player of the week, regardless of how this match went. Can I ask you this? Just, I just have to know. Um, if Tom would have won, just throwing that out there, would we still? Would you still have these same controversies in your head about round one, or would you just not care? I still think, based on previous history, that he should have been given the leeway that other players have given, have been given. Excuse me. You can argue against me, sure, but there has been plenty of leeway that's been established. That's been the precedent. But because it's Tom, he's not going to get the calls that other more beloved players are going to get. So that's just the way the game is for now. Perhaps next year they do a rules summit to truly figure out how they judge spelling mistakes, pronunciation mistakes, when someone answers first and then the other person copies or emulates their answer as far as the pronunciation so there's a lot of these things to work out still but uh look nost he should not have beaten rb3 he barely squeaked by in that match he barely beat tom dagnino again i don't have a lot of confidence in any of his singles or doubles play just really looking for a yes but uh (laughs) okay well said well spoken well frank nine to seven a TKO nonetheless. Is it the lowest scoring match since the Collider inception of the Shmodown? Actually, no. I mean, Unbelievable. Combined, yeah. <laughs> but however, I'll give you I'll tell you this one second before I tell you the other two matches. There's two I'm more matches sure. that were this match, though. This is the first time in the Collider era that we've had a winning score in the single digits. Oh wow. Okay. So nine to seven, that's a total of 16 points. The other previous, well, the second, uh, what second from the bottom, if you want to say, was that Merle Wolf match when Merle won eleven to four. That's when Clark missed some points or missed some questions for to have points drop from her score. So that aided in why that score, that cumulative score, is so low. Uh, total of fifteen points. But the lowest scoring match is the Ashley Robinson versus Mike Kalinowski match in which he oh, right, right, right. KO'd her 11-3 to for a total of 14 points combined. This performance that Nost and Dagnino put on, uh, yeah, not the greatest, and also, oddly enough, not the worst. <laughs> well, let's, I mean, to be fair, let's, let's be 100% fair here, Matt Nost didn't have to answer any round three questions. So True, so great. he could have elevated that percentage or in the points, so, yeah, there's only that possibility. Also, real quick here about Tom Dagnino, yeah. He also didn't answer any round one questions either. So, 
well, Brian, I think you need to learn how to count. I think, I think you actually got five, but okay, move on, please. Um, yeah, four in a row to end the end, end the round. That's that was a nice comeback. Anyways, for Tom Dagnino, this was actually his absolute worst performance. I didn't think it'd be tough because he had some absolute dumpster fires in that 2014 tournament when he faced against Tiffany Smith. That was a really bad one, but he followed up that bad performance with with an even Worst performance when he faced Harloff when he answered only four of 14 questions for a 28.57% accuracy rate. And then this one, he answered four of 17. So that's even lower by 5%. The worst showing he has ever had. He's never scored better than 60% in a match. I don't even know what to say. That. Right. I, yeah, there's there actually uh, what you're looking for is anyways... And yet, Josh McCuga had trouble putting him away. That is very true. That that's was that was the match he had sixty percent, and was uh, that McCuga five rounder, nine to seven. Not the not the prettiest of wins, but it's still a win nonetheless for Matt Nose getting back on track. It, it's like the score of a Tennessee Titans Buffalo Bills football game. Oh, you <laughs> knock it off. You knock it off. Well, it's true. Shut your face, Frank. It's a it's a pretty it's a. Hey, look, we ain't. We, hey, at least it's kind of score. funny that this is the follow up match to Collision. I hey, mean, at least they can score on like the Bears, okay? Oh, <laughs> I can't argue that. <laughs> yeah, I think nine to seven, I think 16 is about the amount of knee surgeries that they're like the cla- That's like the classic score I saw in like 2011 when Kyle Orton was helming the Bears. I mean, that's how they would win all their games. They'd kick three field goals and the team would score one touchdown, and that's. That was your final score. Bears win. Hmm. All right, so let's get to the post-match interview where Roka and Nose were there, and they were, you know, celebrating their victory and how they're going to conquer the Lions in one piece at a time, and I guess beating Tom Dagnino is the way to do that. We were interrupted. We had Emma there with her Space Jam shirt. That was great. She threw it to Grace Hancock. We had Tom. We had Jay Washington and Miss Movies interrupt. A lot of things went down in this post-match interview. Brian, what was your take? Well, as far as bottom 10 is concerned, they uh, said they're starting a new stable. Uh, Obviously, they're turning face, but I I found it rather inappropriate that a stable or team that's turning face would commit acts of body shaming. So I thought that was, again, very inappropriate. Very, uh, I thought that was very cruel. And as far as Jay and Miss Movies coming out to challenge Tom, regardless of the outcome to Miss Movies and Killer Kalinowski... Uh, it seems like a fitting match because Christian loves to do these revenge matches. And Christian basically said in the post match that once Tom plays Miss Movies, he's going to go back to full time manager at that point. I mean, he was basically uh, putting up a, a neon sign saying Miss Movies will be Tom's last match. So Jay Washington, though, continues to be a huge threat on the mic. Uh, he's no Tom, but he's right up there with the best of them. So the managers, Christian has really gone out of his way to uh, show us that the managers, the mouthpieces, that they have a place in this game. It seemed like Tom had a healthy respect for what Jay was bringing. Well, so, as you said, Aaron, you are scared of Jay Washington. So fact. Tom Dagnino, it's got to be intimidating for him as well to have Jay, the urban gladiator, in your face. That's a large, well-spoken man, and that's terrifying to me. So, Frank, what did you think of this post-match interview? What did you take away? Ugh, I was terrified of Jay. I was terrified. I I could barely look at the screen. I was so scared. That's not even. I'm not even making that up. I was. I could barely watch him talk to Dagnino because, like, oh my god, he's gonna break him in half with just his words. It was great stuff from Jay. I don't think. I mean, he's getting better and better every time we see him in a post-match interview, pre, pre-match pre interview, whatever he's doing, he's getting better and better, and he's really going at these people. And you could kind of tell Tom didn't have a whole lot to say at the moment, in the moment, because once Jay exited, then Tom came up with some good stuff here and there, and that was after the fact. So it just proved that Jay's, I think, he can mess with your mind when he's right in your face, and then he goes away, and then you kind of get back to your normal self. But that's something that, Jay brings to this league that I don't think really anybody else has done as effective. So I look forward to a lot more Jay Washington talking a lot more smack and Hey, maybe he'll be in a match pretty soon one day and uh, he can do some more smack talking in the ring. Let me just say something. I know that Jay is the mouthpiece for six degrees right now. And I know that six degrees is now talking less, but I hope that they can work in Miss movies catchphrase. You're dismissed every single time. 
that Jay takes the lead in these cases. I know Miss Movies is okay with it, but at least set her up for your dismiss before they exit the stage. You know, actually, I, I like it if if it's more, I don't think it should be kind of like a sign-off kind of deal. But when well, I don't like Miss Movies being thing, up there without saying anything. I want to have Miss Movies say something instead I, of nothing. I mean, Well, that's fine. She can say something. I I. I I can kind of get on board with it. I really, I kind of like this, this silent kind of thing that Brienne does. But when she says, eventually does say dismissed, when she says it, I want it to be powerful and very, very meaningful because something, something bad is about to go down for that other person. And this dismissed catchphrase of hers, uh, I just think it's, it can be used in a very powerful way. And yeah, yeah, Jay can set her up for that. Jay can set her up for a powerful delivery of her catchphrase. <laughs> and since WWE is really, showing its uh, influence on this league lately, having these characters reinforce their catchphrase more frequently is very important, especially when she's one of the few characters that has a solidified catchphrase. So if she's not going to talk, at least give her an opportunity to exit the stage with a you're dismissed. That way, she made her presence felt without talking. I'm telling you, you're going to start seeing it a lot more often. I think you're going to see a healthy influence of not only WWE, but Glow as well, of how well Glow... I think I said that the last episode, but... Yeah. Glow Overrated been... show, by the way. Oh. <laughs> or should I say Gloverated? <sighs> Please no, don't no, talk. No, just say, no, just say overrated. <laughs> Please, don't talk to... Please don't talk to me for the rest of the show. But um, <laughs> yeah, Glow is going to have a positive influence. I think you're going to see a lot more creative things coming in terms of the Shimonion based off of that and how people respond to that. So, well, Aaron, let me ask you, do you think we're getting enough of the catchphrase mic drop moments in this league? When you consider uh, what the rock has done, what stone cold has done in the WWE, where basically every time they come out, they close with their catchphrase before leaving the ring. I think it's okay right now the way that Jay did it because it wasn't after a match. I think if it's after a match, you absolutely have to use that catchphrase. But in terms of just kind of an impromptu walk-in, it's not necessary. It's important because it's kind of like her brand now. Like that that catchphrase is on a t-shirt that I own. It says you're dismissed on it. So it's important to her character, yes. But in that particular instance where it's kind of a run-in, it's not as important. But I see what you're saying. Well, that's going to wrap up our coverage of the thrilling Matt Nose versus Tom Dagnino matchup. We're going to go to a little iTunes break, and we'll be right back. We interrupt this amazing episode of the Schmodown Rundown to bring you this news. Do you like what you've heard so far? Do you like the Schmodown Rundown? And of course, why wouldn't you? Do us a favor. If you are listening on iTunes, please rate and review the show along with all the other shows on the Schmoes No feed. If you are watching via YouTube on the SK Plus channel, be sure to like and leave a comment. We would really appreciate that, and it will help out all the other shows on the channel, such as Outlaw Nation with John Roca, the Harloff Podcast with Christian Harloff, the Wanger Show, among the rest of the shows on the channel. Something new for everybody every single day, so definitely check out the SK Plus feed, and the Schmoes No iTunes feed. And now back to the best-looking host on the channel, Aaron Turner. All right, guys, we're back with some team preview action this week. It will be William Bibiani and Whitney Seibold, dubbed critically acclaimed, we'll get to that in a second, versus DJ Woolridge and Sam Basher. Frank, we've got two debuting teams. One person of the three has been in the Schmodown before. What do you think? Who you got? I think it was Chris Clark in the Facebook page who put up a poll. Is Critically Clam going to win or is Only Stupid Andrew's going to win? And a lot of people in the page predictably pick Bibiani, Whitney team. And I hearken back to when we thought Wolves of Steel was going to win the title. I mean, Clark and Riley teaming up. Watch out, everyone. It's Might as well hand them the trophy. Then they had their first match against Heroes and they lost. It didn't go their way. I don't want to overhype critically acclaimed. Bibiani's very good. I'm not as familiar with Whitney Seibold as some people out there may be. So I'm going to go pick only stupid answers just because it's always fun to root for the underdog. And I'm 
I'm a little more familiar with DJ and Sam from uh, Source Fed, Source Fed Nerd, and uh, I saw them talk movies, and I think they definitely have a shot. Although, I mean, everybody's really picking critically acclaimed to win, but I wouldn't be surprised if Only Stupid Answers won. So I'm just, I'm just going to take them. All right. Well, I didn't. I don't remember myself checking out any Source Fed. I'm a big fan of Think Hero. Big fan of that page. Brian, you see these two teams. Who you got here? Well, I'm surprised that uh, Frank has not seen Die Hard from the sound of it, since he doesn't know who Whitney Seibold is. But <laughs> team, team critically acclaimed, they're going to turn only stupid answers team name against them by beating them handily. Harry from Die Hard will establish himself and the Beast, Harry Beast, as a doubles team to be reckoned with. Critically acclaimed wins easy. All right, well, before I get to this, I have to do a correction. And this is going to sound weird, but I have to correct the commissioner. You posted that I came up with the name Critically Acclaimed. It's not exactly true. And wait, was, wait, wait. Are you trying to take away credit from yourself? Are you trying to uncredit yourself? I, I am. I just I want to set the record straight. I like to keep it 100. That's kind of my deal. But I did not come up with the name Critically Acclaimed for Bibbs and Whitney specifically. I had an idea a couple episodes ago, like maybe months ago, that there would be a stable of Bibbs, Whitney, Mark Bernard, and Andrew McWheeney, and they would collectively be called critically acclaimed. Now, whether that was kind of a runoff and they approved that, that's fine, whatever. I can't fully take credit for that, so I won't. I will recuse myself from that credit, <laughs> although I do appreciate it. Um, I still prefer the name Beauty and the Beast. I think that's a lot of fun and strange. And I know they hate that movie, so that make, kind of makes it even better. So, um, That being said, all that fun stuff, I'm going to take Bibbs and Whitney. I think they're going to win, and I think I'm on Team Brian here. I think they're going to win handily. Let's go to the singles preview this week. It will be Miss Movies, Brianne Chandler, our friend of the show, versus The Killer, or Batman, is it? Mike Kalinowski... Fresh off of his General Hospital casting, Killer Kalinowski is going to put Miss Movies under with surgical precision. Miss Movies will likely have the match within reach, but there tends to be a question each match that trips her up, so this match will be that rare occasion where a scalpel stops a samurai sword. It's Killer in a Thriller. Frank Janish, man, you see these two here, they've had some heated words back and forth on Twitter. What are you thinking here? Are you leaning it towards? I am going to take Brienne. I think okay. her studying is going to to pay off here. And I think Kalinowski being busy shooting General Hospital and all that stuff. I don't I don't know how much time he's had to devote to general movie trivia. We know that he certainly devotes time to Inner Geekdom series. Uh, he's performed really well in there. So I think basically if he's going to win, he's going to have to get some geek-friendly categories to really uh, seal the deal here. Otherwise, it's going to be very close, and then I'm going to still give the edge to Brienne in the close one. I'm going to do something that's never been done on this show. I'm going to do it right here. Not picking a winner. No, nope, you got to pick a winner. No, I don't. You do. Yeah, you do. It's my show. It's my show. I actually don't have to pick a winner. I don't have to do anything. I recuse myself from picking here because Brienne Chandler in this movie is a, a big fan of this show, and I feel like it's not fair of me to pick for or against her because it's not it's, it's weird and i don't okay. want to do that off so the I, record off the record who would you pick i recuse myself i played the fifth um <laughs> oh i would my like God. <laughs> i'd like for the first time ever in the history of this show to push well if it ends in a tie then i'll, I'll be really amazed but i will <laughs> yeah you would win that's, that's all that matters well that was exciting how about that exciting synopsis i pushed wow First time ever on the show. Anybody else got anything fun they want to talk about? Jumping jacks. I like doing jumping jacks. Hey, fun fact. I used to be a bouncer at a strip club. All right, let's get out of here. <laughs> and that's that's a shoot. Appreciate you guys joining us for this uh, shorter version of the Schmodown Rundown. We only had one match to cover this week, so it was a little bit shorter. It definitely wasn't the uh, three-hour Broadway we did last week, uh, which we definitely appreciate everybody checking out and for all you first-time listeners that listen to all of our content last week and that have come back for this episode, they're usually longer. <laughs> Just start there. But uh, we appreciate you coming over. We appreciate the comments. Uh, keep them coming. Uh, let us know what you think. Let us know what you want to improve, and and we'll take it from there. But Frank Janish, where can you be found? Where can we find your amazing stats? You can find me on Instagram and Twitter 
at frankiej29. You can also follow me on Stardust if you like. I'll follow you back, too. I like to see everyone's uh, little little mini reviews. And then if you are still interested in what happened at Collider Collision, you can go to schmoesno.com and look up my full statistical recap. It's quite extensive. There's just about stats or anything you could think of. Hopefully, I covered it. And uh, also weekly, that's a thing, too, as well, a recap article on schmoesno.com. Brian Davids, where can you be found, sir? What do you got going on? Well, I just want to say one thing before we go. Oh, boy. Avoid judging a situation before you have all the facts, all the information, and all the evidence. It'd be a shame to judge before you have all or any of those things. You guys can follow me, Brian Davids, on Twitter at BDF331, and check out my TV film podcast at filmschlubspodcast.com or wherever podcasts are found. Special thanks to Brian Ward once again for artwork this week. Follow Brian on Twitter at Brian E. Ward and make sure to check out his website and portfolio at brianeward.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at AT Titanium. My name is Aaron. You can also catch my wrestling podcast at soundcloud.com forward slash wanna wrestle pod, iTunes, Stitcher, all that kind of good stuff. It's on there. My good buddy Shane Nixon and I just recapped the latest WWE Raw pay per view. Great balls of fire, terrible name, but a great event. And we're going to be covering Battleground here in the next week or so. So definitely check us out, support us, follow the show at SD Rundown. Special thanks to Miss Movies, Brian Chandler, for the intro. We sincerely appreciate it, and we'll catch you guys next week. See you.